and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be hosting this discussion today. We're pleased to be hearing from Saleh Houdiar, Prime Minister of the East Turkestan government in exile. Prime Minister Houdiar is unable to join us live for a Zoom webinar. However, we pre-recorded his lecture on persecuted Uyghurs, silent Muslim leaders. And now I will share our discussion with Saleh Houdiar. Firstly, um, I'd like to thank the Middle East Forum um, for uh, having me on this webinar. Um, it's truly an honor to talk about this um, much needed uh, issue, uh, this issue. Um, the issue of the Uyghurs or the issue of East Turkestan is something that has not been getting as much attention as it deserves. Uh, over the past few years, um, China has been engaging or exacerbating the decades of colonization um, and occupation in East Turkestan and has been undertaking a brutal campaign of genocide against the Uyghur and other Turkic peoples of East Turkestan, including Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and Tatars. Um, in recent years, the issue has been becoming to the fore of the international um, politics, international human rights, uh, mostly because of the United States and more specifically because of the actions uh, taken by the Trump administration and um, Secretary Pompeo. Not my, many people understand what really is truly happening in East Turkestan, or many people don't even understand who the Uyghurs are or where East Turkestan is. So firstly, I'd like to start off by talking about who the Uyghurs are. The Uyghurs, as we call it, are a ethnically Turkic people. We are predominantly Muslim who follow a very um, secular um, and uh, form of Islam, a very moderate form of Islam uh, known as Hanafi Sunni Islam. Um, with, thousand, with the history of over 6,000 years, the Uyghurs have predominantly throughout history have embraced many different religions. Mm -hmm. um, they were originally shamans, and they've accepted Zoroastrianism. Um, at one point in time, for about uh, over three centuries, the Uyghurs were predominantly historian Christians. Um, it was only in, in, the ninth, in the 10th century that Islam began to come into Central Asia. And Uyghurs began to accept um, Islam as a, uh, as a religion, but it wasn't until the 17th century, really, that Islam became the dominant religion in East Turkestan. In about around the same time in the 17th, late 17th century, you had called Naqshbandi Sufis who emigrated, uh, people say, from Iran. Uh, who claimed to be persecuted and had settled in East Turkestan. Uh, it is because of these Naqshbandi Sufis that East Turkestan actually went into a decline, both politically and culturally. Uh, the Naqshbandi Sufis began to preach a, a uh, extreme version of Islam in which everything, science, culture, uh, music, and other topics, other subjects were pretty much banned by the Naqshbandi Sufis. They worked with the Jungar Mongols to overthrow the pre-existing uh, Yarkand Khanate in 1705. And in 1759, once the Jungars realized, because the Jungars themselves are Buddhist, they realized that the uh, Naqshbandi Sufis were a threat to the pre-existing uh, multi-religious culture that existed in East Pakistan, they actually banished them. And this led to the Naqshbandis bringing in, um, aligning themselves with the Qing dynasty, bringing in, you know, the conquest of uh, East Pakistan by the Manchu Qing dynasty in 1759. 
So for about a hundred years, East Turkestan was governed by the the uh, the Hojas, as they were called, these Shibandi Sufis, um, and under the auspices of the Qing dynasty, the people of East Turkestan rebelled some 42 times during this period, and managed to, um, you know, declare their independence uh, in 1863 as the state of East Turkestan. Kashkari. During this time, the uh, the great game in which the British and the Russian Empire were competing for um, influence or control of Central Asia pitted East Turkestan against the Qing Dynasty once more, in which the British, fearing that the Russians would take over East Turkestan, helped finance the um, to conquest of East Turkestan in 1876. The Manchus were able to successfully conquer East Turkestan for the first time in 1884, renaming it to Xinjiang, meaning the new territory. Uh, in the 19, early 1900s, with the fall of the uh, Manchu Qing dynasty, a lot of uh, Uyghurs had traveled, you know, traveled beyond East Turkestan into Europe and Russia and other places where they began to understand, you know, get the ideas of nationalism uh, and national identity. So with this, they brought these modernist ideas, progressives, and this a little bit of a, a clash between the pre-existing ulama ruling class and the new moderates, so mostly young students who had, you know, realized that the people of Pakistan was much far behind in terms of the modern world. Uh, with this, the modern uh, youth, they instilled, you know, nationalism and anti-colonialism against the Chinese forces. Um, and we declared independence for the first time on November 12, 1933. The Soviets intervened and crushed the Republic within um, six years and stated that it was like a British creation, though this was not really necessarily true. The British possibly had supported it to a certain extent. There was no really, it wasn't a British creation. 11 years later, the people of East Turkestan declared independence once more, but this time uh, the Soviets did support it. The Soviets supported this due to their geopolitical ambitions. Uh, East Turkestan, like today, was rich in mineral resources, especially rare earth minerals like uh, uranium, which the Soviets needed to develop you know, the atomic bomb uh, that they would later test in 1949. So, in order to get the access to this, the Soviets helped support the Second East Turkestan Republic against the Chinese nationalists. Um, and East Turkestan maintained its independence for about five years before uh, Mao ultimately sold out East Turkestan, I mean, um, Stalin ultimately sold out East Turkestan to Mao and helped Mao uh, occupy East Turkestan in, in December 22nd, 1949. Since then, China has been waging essentially colonization at the time in 1949, whether you look at um, CIA records from the period, or whether you look at you know historical records from the East Turkestan Republic, or whether you look at Soviet records, the Chinese population in East Turkestan at that time was less than five percent. Come back 70 years, come to 70 years later today, the Chinese population in East Turkestan amount to roughly 40 percent of East Turkestan's population. Um, and this has been uh, has been undertaken as a result of you know China's policy to colonize East Turkestan under the guise of developing and modernizing East Turkestan. The same promises that it's making to you know various countries um, neighboring you know China uh, or neighboring East Turkestan, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Central Asia, or whether it's even countries in Africa, China Road Initiative is investing billions, tens of billions of dollars, if not hundreds of billions of dollars, and you know, saying that we're gonna help modernize your country. While at the same time, they're bringing in mostly Chinese male workers to 
you know, help build these bridges, these roads, these uh, massive infrastructure projects, and in a way, engaging in neo-colonialism. So what really changed was with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1990, uh, 1991, this re-inspired the people of East Turkestan to push for the independence. I mean, for the past 70, uh, for the past 60 years prior to that, 50, 60 years prior to that, the people of East Turkestan had really never given up on their independence, but it was much contained uh, due to the repressive nature of the Chinese government. With the fall of the Soviet Union, China became more fearful that, you know, Western countries um, like the United States, like Europe, would support East Turkestan to get to regain its independence. So they began to engage in uh, a massive crackdown um, or the strike hard campaigns in which uh, during the strike hard campaign, hundreds of thousands of people were arbitrarily detained, much like today. Um, and those who were believed to be ethnic nationalists were you know, declared as either ethnic nationalists or ethnic separatists and thrown into prison. Um, and there was a substantial Western support for the East Turkestan movement at the time. However, 9-11 happened and China began to capitalize off of the fact that majority of the Uyghurs are Muslims and stated that, you know, it was fighting against terrorism. Um, it, it managed to convince the U.S. and others um, as part of it, possibly a quid quo pro, uh, to recognize a non-existing group called the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, which ironically has the same acronym as the broad East Turkestan na uh, Independence Movement, which is actually a national secular movement. And began to blame everything on this movement using this this ETIM, this non-existent ETIM as a scapegoat for all of its atrocities that it would really commit. Starting in 2014, you had the Chinese government um, tighten control over East Turkestan, well, really after 2009. But then you had the flow of Uyghurs who magically somehow managed to evade hundreds of police and military checkpoints go thousands of miles throughout China into uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, where they were given Turkish passports and flown to Turkey and then subsequently sent to Syria to fight against, you know, Assad alongside other Turkish, you know, proxies. And China pointed to them as an excuse to why it needed to clamp down on what it called, you know, Uyghur terrorism by locking up millions of people in concentration camps. Um, we suspect that the Uyghurs that were sent, you know, that were able to leave at that time, we suspect that it was part of a Chinese intelligence operation to deliberately label and portray Uyghurs as terrorists to help justify the upcoming oppression, the upcoming concentration camps. Um, why we suspect this is, at the time, no one has passports. The Chinese government had taken away everyone's passports. You, there are checkpoints every 500 meters. There's no way you can go 500 meters without hitting a checkpoint. You can't even leave your own hometown without getting special permission from your local uh, public security bureau. So how is it possible that 20,000 people were just able to, you know, walk out of East Turkestan into China and through the most border, you know, the most controlled secure borders in the world without Chinese intelligence or security forces not being aware. Now let's come back to 2010. In 2010, China and Turkey signed a 10 point strategic agreement, including intelligence sharing, military cooperation, economic cooperation, tourism, and many other fields. Turkey, on the other hand, needs, you know, foreign fighters, you know, to fight again, to fight its battles in Syria, to use as cannon fodder. So when you have a naive population 
like the Uyghurs who are disgruntled, many of them who were brought there saying, no, we're going to help you train so you can fight against China. Most of them have already died in Syria. Um, they were lured into Syria and were used to, you know, as, as cannon fodder. And this gave, you know, Turkey an advantage, free soldiers or free, you know, people to fight on their behalf. China needed the perfect excuse to legitimize its upcoming campaign. Starting from 2016, China began to detain millions of people, regardless of their ethnic uh, or religious identity, so long as they were non-Chinese peoples or Turkic peoples. Um, that's why you have Uyghur Christians that are in the camps as well. And the media has played a very, um, you know, a very big role in misportraying this issue as just an issue of Uyghur Muslims. Um, there are other Turkic peoples like Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, Tatars that are being locked up in the camps as well. And not many of them are mentioned in the media. Uh, the media had highlighted this issue as it's just an attack on Uyghur, Uyghur Muslims, but it's, a t it's an attack on total Turkic identity, whether you're Uyghur, whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Buddhist, the Chinese government does not care because it sees you as a threat because what it is fe feeling, what it views as the biggest threat as defined in its national defense strategies over the past decade is, you know, they, they're one of their top five goals is to prevent the creation or the independence of East Turkestan. So this is the real reason why China is engaging in, in this genocide. Um, and despite all of this, only the Western countries really it was starting in 2017 under the Trump administration that Secretary Pompeo began to highlight this issue. It wasn't until 2018, until when other countries in Europe would began to, uh, you know, speak out against this issue. But to this day, over the past, you know, uh, four or five years, uh, four years, let's say, no, no Muslim government has spoken out against these atrocities. Turkey has not spoken out because it's receiving a lot of money from China. Uh, Muslim countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and others have actually, including Turkey, have actually deported Uyghurs where they were subsequently thrown into concentration camps or prisons or disappeared. Um, and they are quick to, you know, especially countries like Pakistan, they, they're, 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 they're our neighbor. They're a neighbor to East Turkestan. They know more about East Turkestan than, let's say, perhaps other Muslim countries. But Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan thinks that, you know, he, he stated that he's unaware of the situation, which is an absolute lie. And more recently, earlier this, uh, this month, his um, national security advisor stated, you know, we have 100 percent no problem with what China is doing. This issue is not an issue for us. So ultimately giving China the green light to, you know, continue its uh, genocide. So the Muslim world has been very hypocritical in terms of their response. Uh, they have been, you know, accusing the West of Islamophobia. But China is the real one that's engaging in Islamophobia. I mean, China has, over the past several years, has destroyed over 16,000 mosques, burned Qurans and other religious texts, are, you know, forcing... Even Muslim names are banned. Even saying "Assalamu alaikum," which is a meaning saying "peace be upon you," is banned and is one of the reasons for you to be sent to a concentration camp. Um, the Muslim world knows exactly what's going on, but because of China's money and their economic, you know, uh, relations that they have with these countries, these countries are turning a blind eye to the greatest attack on Muslims in any part of the world. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, the first question in is, um, are there any exceptions to that? Are there any Muslim majority governments that stand firmly with the Uyghurs against the Chinese government? Unfortunately, um, there are no Muslim majority governments that have stood with 
you know, the Uyghurs, the Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples. Um, Turkey historically would say, you know, we support, you know, the Uyghurs, they are like our brothers, but especially under the Erdogan administration, they have become increasingly closer with China, and therefore they have just pretty much ignored our, our plight. So how do you explain the shift by Erdogan of Turkey from support to abandoning the Uyghurs? So Turkey really has never supported the Uyghurs. I mean, giving them refuge, if that, if you consider that support, okay, that's, we can say that. But beyond that, uh, Turkey has never done that, never given actual support to our, our issue. That's why nobody knew about our issue uh, up until more recently. Um, everybody knows about other other issues, but when it comes to us, nobody knows. And if Turkey really was supporting us, the world would probably know who the Uyghurs are, know where East Turkestan is. Um, but every Turkish politician that's running up for president, you know, now you see it, they will generally, including Erdogan himself, you know, they would raise the East Turkestan issue as a way of getting elected because the Turkish people themselves know about East Turkestan. They have, you know, we're, we're all Turkish people, so they feel for East Turkestan. They have a common, you know, uh, ancestry and they, to them, the East Turkestan issue is important. So to get, you know, votes, they will talk about the issue, but once they actually come into power, they will completely ignore it. And this has been ongoing, you know, for decades. This is how Turkish politics has been. So there's no way that the public support of East Turkestan would um, change that? I mean, the public, the public has been supporting East Turkestan for decades. Uh, the Turkish political system, the way that they do it, I mean, in order to get the votes, they promise, you know, they'll do this, they'll do that, and they'll raise the issue. But once they are actually in power, they're just uh, completely silent. And this is how we viewed it. And the public support um, has not been able to change that. Understood. Uh, has there been any support from Mohammed bin Salam of Saudi Arabia? And has there since been the abandonment that we saw? Uh, unfortunately, it, historically, Saudi Arabia has given refuge to you know, people from East Turkestan. Um, but more recently, um, as Saudi Arabia developed its relationship with China, um, China has made it very clear that they don't want Saudi Arabia to support our, our, our issue, our cause at any, at any level. Um, and because of this, uh, Saudi Arabia um, and you know, the, the prince actually recently, last year or two years ago, went to China and signed a, a major uh, oil deal with, with China. Um, in fact, he praised while he was there as part of the deal, he praised uh, China's, you know, counterterrorism and modernization efforts in East Turkestan. Well, that's a little nerve wracking. Um, so which governments around the world have been the best supporters? So the best supporters, I would have to say, has been the United States government. Um, the United States government, especially under the Trump administration, has been really highlighting our issue, um, calling on other governments across the world to take up our issue and to speak out against, you know, the atrocities. The U.S. government um, over the past three years has sanctioned uh, Chinese officials responsible for the atrocities. They've, you know, signed the Uyghur Act into law. They are on the brink of recognizing the atrocities as a genocide. And they have sanctioned a, the paramilitary force, which is uh, responsible for, you know, ha has the most crucial role in terms of subjugating East Turkestan, the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, which is a three and a half million strong paramilitary force that was originally set up in 1954 to colonize East Turkestan. So that it was a big, a big move on part of the U.S. Um, in recent um, in recent year, in the past year, you had European countries like the UK, 
France, parliamentarians from uh, many various uh, European countries speak out against these atrocities. Um, but I would say the United States is the number one support that we have at the at the moment. So with the Trump administration having been such a strong ally, how do you see a Biden administration playing out? Um, we are very anxious. Uh, we're actually very worried. Um, earlier this month, the Trump administration delisted the so-called East Turkestan Islamic movement from its terror list, uh, citing that there is no um, evidence that the group even exists other than what the Chinese claim. Um, and we fear that if the Biden administration, if there is a Biden administration, uh, they might put this group back on the list as part of uh, China's, um, as part of, excuse me, as part of um, China's, you know, as part of realigning themselves with China, developing, you know, improving relations with China. Uh, we also fear that, one second. Sorry. We also fear that the that other than you know they might raise some human rights issues, but as far as like the overall political issue, I, I think they will uh, remain. Remain um, silent on, on it. Um, because under the Obama administration, Biden. Biden, he was the vice president during the Obama administration. Uh, the atrocities that are happening today, um, you know, were occurring to a lesser extent at that time. But the by, uh, the Obama administration during their eight years did not even, you know, speak out, out once against, you know, what China was doing uh, to the Uyghurs and the Turkic peoples in East Turkestan. Uh, instead, you know, they were, you know, improving relations with China. And it was because, you know, there was no official response. Because in 2014, what the Chinese government did was initially they, they rounded up roughly about 200,000 men between the ages of 15 and 45 and put them into, you know, so-called re-education camps, concentration camps and prisons under the basis that, you know, they were become they were prone to becoming radicalized. And they publicized this to, to kind of gauge the international reaction. Once there was no international reaction, this gave China the green light to continue, you know, to further this by throwing the entire um, population or much of the entire population, regardless of whether it's a man, whether it's a woman, whether they're religious, whether they're secular, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Christian, whether they're Buddhist, uh, just to, you know, achieve its goal of preventing, you know, East Turkestan's independence. So what policy recommendations would you suggest for the EU and the US that they should adopt? So one of the first things that the EU and the US needs to do um, earlier, uh, two weeks ago, the US Senate introduced a resolution recognizing uh, China's atrocities against Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples as a genocide. The Canadian Parliament did this the week prior to that. So we urge the US government and the EU to recognize China's atrocities as a genocide. Secondly, we urge the US and the EU to treat our issue on par with the Tibetan issue. Nobody refers to Tibet uh, except China as Shizong, which is a colonial name that China imposed on Tibet. Likewise, we ask people, you know, countries to refer to our country as East Turkestan, the original name. When you look at historical maps prior to 1949, you know, whether it's U.S. maps, whether it's uh, European maps, it'll say East Turkestan, the way it was, um, instead of using the Chinese colonial term Xinjiang. We also ask that they recognize East Turkestan like they recognize Tibet as an occupied country, because essentially, this is the root of the problem. Uh, it is because that we are an occupied country that China is able to, you know, engage in these atrocities um, and it's colonizing our, our country like they're colonizing Tibet, um, essentially to help achieve their long term strategic goals of becoming the world's most dominant political, economic and military power. 
Thank you so much. And before we end the webinar, uh, can you just give us a little information on where we can find some more information on this topic? Yes, uh, you can visit our website at www.east-turkistan.net, east-turkistan.net, and follow us on uh, social media on Twitter and Facebook at etexilegov. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed our lecture by Sally Hudiar. Uh, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful day.